everyone, welcome back. Time for a long overdue update on the Hummingbird progress. Another couple, I think 250 hours since our last September update and a lot of good progress. So we'll try and walk you through some of it, some of the things uh, that have happened. I'm actually into what I call the exciting part of the helicopter where I can do things that I wanna do rather than try and figure out, you know, what somebody was trying to figure out in the plans. Specifically, that's a lot of the instruments, the wiring, and uh, what I call ergonomics in the cockpit. So let's, let's talk about some of that stuff on where we're at. We bring the camera over here closer. We'll see since last time, we've been focused quite a bit on the interior. Uh, Carol's actually managed to get a lot of the carpeting done. The whole floor area is complete. Uh, this is um, FAA approved fire flame proof fabric. It's uh, throughout as well as some really nice ultra Ultra leather, leather, ultra leather, ultra leather panels here. I think the last time I showed you, I was actually working on a power outlet right here. That's now complete. It came out really nicely. And uh, I don't know if you can kind of zoom in over here. The instruments wiring, actually the wiring for the whole helicopter, less one wire, I think, is all done. I'm always uh, telling Carol I'm finished with the wiring, and then I'll go in and she says, what'd you do? And then, oh, I ran another wire. So... We'll call it somewhat complete. Um, really, really excited. If you want to look over here, these panels actually showed up last night from Advanced Flight Systems. So I'm anxious to get started on those this morning. Carol told me I had to do this video first. So uh, I can't wait to actually get this all connected to and the panels. And what's in that back? Oh, so if you look back here, this is some more. There's a light help. You can see the Advanced Control Module. That's what everything wires to that and controls uh, uh, everything uh, electrically on the aircraft. So there are no circuit breakers anywhere anymore. It's all electronic. And I see a backup battery. There's a backup battery over there as well uh, that will run the EFIS just in case you have an electrical failure. It's also nice to be able to power up the EFIS with the backup battery uh, to do things on the ground without having to power everything up, the entire aircraft. Uh, let's see, while we're in this area, we can talk about heel rests. I did make some modifications here. The plans call for the heel rest to be about 1.62 inches off of the ground here. And when I sat in there, my feet, to actually use the brakes, the angle, actually you had to pull your foot off of the heel rest a little bit to actuate brakes. And I talked to a, a newly completed humming build, uh, hummingbird helicopter pilot who's actually a former Marine One pilot. And he mentioned the same thing. He did not like having to lift his feet up to apply brakes. If you uh, remember in the last uh, update, I mentioned this is a wheeled helicopter. So brakes are really important for startup and shutdown to keep the nose from shifting left or right from the torque uh, on the main rotor blade. So uh, I actually raised these. Now we got a really nice angle here. And how I figured that out was if you look at the co-pilots brakes over there. You can see they are at the height that's specified in the plans. And I just kept stacking pieces of wood on there till my heel actually would stay at rest while I could apply brakes. And so I came up with this height. Hopefully that's going to work. The seats have been installed. Uh, I actually elevated them just a little on some nice wooden uh, things here for good support. And while we're in this area, you can see we've got the collective installed. This is already set for five degree angle here at rest, and then another 20 degrees of movement to full up. Now, of course, we'll be rigging the helicopter once it's all together to make sure that's all right, but those, that's in according to the specifications and the plans right now. If we uh, come along to the front here, you can see the control sticks have done. Uh, the stick grips, I like the infinity stick grips, by the way, these were, this time were provided in the kit, which was really, really nice. Uh, they're all wired, functional, and I don't know if I did mention, but I have, with a battery, tested all the circuits individually, including the trim circuits here, and so I know everything works. It'll be neat to get the panels on today and be able to do everything through a uh, uh, single-point battery on the aircraft, but this is all working. If you come across here to the top, this was a little bit of work. This was the instrument panel. Uh, again, took a piece of ultra, ultra leather here. It actually took a pretty big piece to wrap this all around in one piece. And then I vented it with some snap rings, this being black, and you've got all this open uh, windshield here. The sun hitting this is definitely going to get hot. So I vented it with uh, about, about uh, 14 or so snap rings. 
And one of the things I did with these snap rings, if you can see here, they're, they're kind of dull on top. I've done this same thing in some of my other airplanes to vent the instruments. And, uh, I, I, you know, these are kind of shiny on top, the way they come out of the box. So I took some emery cloth and Scotch-Brite and dulled them. It should hopefully stop the reflection uh, in the windscreen there. Let's see, the pitot tube here is installed and plumbed. I don't know if we had that in last time. Uh, I have leak checked the static system. It is type free. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the other things we've uh, managed to accomplish here. All four doors have been fitted. Uh, not exactly happy with the perf they're not a perfect fit. I've been spending a lot of time working on them, trying to get them there. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, they will get there. They're fiberglass doors. Uh, on a metal frame, so just the, the perfect match fit here is starting to come together with a lot of heat gun usage. Uh, here you can see the mechanism to open the door and close the door. This work came out very nicely. One of the things I did here to make a nice door handle is I took a stainless steel AN bolt, chucked it in the drill press, and then with a file ground off the hex head, so it made a nice little round head on there. So that works out nicely. And I've kind of protected the fiberglass here with this uh, nice aluminum plate. So that all works very nicely. You can see that, okay. Things will work much easier when the thing is finally finished. Right now we don't put any lubricants anywhere because we haven't painted yet. Also for ventilation, stole an idea from Vans. Use some of the vent kits that we use on the RV-10, which work very, very nicely. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some adequate ventilation here in the back and the front uh, door, which uh, unfortunately don't have on right now. Uh, we also have a vent here and a snap vent in the window, so we should get plenty of ventilation. And then it is a helicopter, so we do get to fly with the doors off in the summertime, so that will be very, very nice. Uh, let's see, nav lights are on. We have showed you that last time. So coming around to the rear here now, you can see the engine compartment is just waiting on a Lycoming engine which Lycoming Thunderbolt Division tells me they're starting either this week or next week. So hopefully I'm gonna have that within a few weeks here. But everything has been wired, all the sensors, uh, everything is wired back here. Fuel pumps are installed, all the pressure senders, uh, pulleys, cables, hoses, uh, oil tank here, and the engine mount is uh, on. We're just waiting on that engine. I can't wait to get that. Once we get that engine here, we'll make a lot of progress in this engine compartment with the baffling. I have built the clutch assembly already. We'll show that to you in a bit. If you can zoom in here, uh, you'll see this is the coupling that goes to the engine via the clutch. And right up here, we've got a rotor brake. It's really nice to have a rotor brake because when you shut down a helicopter, the blades kind of spin for a very long time and it is a little bit dangerous. You want to stay by the helicopter till they quit spinning. This one has a nice rotor brake on it so we can shut that down from inside the cockpit. If you can zoom in on that, I'll show how it works. We actually have a working uh, cable connection here. I've got the rotor brake handle installed. So you can see right there is that brake kind of catches this. Now, this won't turn anymore. And so we'll take the rotor brake off. And you'll see that this in fact now turns the whole transmission. So that works very, very nicely. It's nice to see some working parts at this stage. Uh, let's see, am I missing anything here from since the last time we do have throttle cables as well. Have to install a mixture cable. I was waiting on the instrument panels to get here for that. And uh, why don't we go grab the clutch assembly and we'll show that. So here's the clutch assembly, uh, which is also the cooling fan. So it's a helicopter with an air-cooled engine. We don't have a propeller supplying cooling air to the engine. So you've got these fan blades, much like the radiator set up in your car, the uh, fan blades, same, same concept here. But this is also the clutch assembly. What happens here is this is connected to that coupling that I showed you a little bit ago on the helicopter. This whole fan is spinning whenever the engine is running, okay? Um, and that's keeping the engine cool on the ground. You can see this is freewheeling. This is the clutch portion. So we'll show you a still picture uh, within this video. Inside here are 12 plates, much like brake shoes. Centrifugal force right around 1,800 RPMs forces them out and then engages the clutch so it, it, it you know just makes this tight to the engine 
And then this turns and everything on the helicopter turns. The rotors through the transmission, and then there's also a tail rotor uh, line to go to the tail rotor transmission. There's also a spray clutch right inside this front portion here, such that if the engine does quit, it allows the blades to freewheel for an auto rotation. So this thing's very heavy. It took about a day and a half to do. Let me show you, I don't know if you can zoom in here on the back side. Can you see the safety wire here? Does that show up or do we need yes. a light on it? It shows yep, up? It shows up. All right, I like this. It's, uh, you know, this thing came balanced, so I'm trying to keep it somewhat light and balanced. But this is a safety cable. Instead of having to put safety wire through there and twist it all up, uh, this 32,000 safety cable works very, very nicely. You feed it through, and then you attach a ferrule on the uh, end point, make sure it's tight, and uh, crimps. So adds very little weight. And, and hope, does that require a special tool? It does require a special tool to do that. Uh, matter of fact, we'll get a picture of that here in a bit. I'll show you tool that I mentioned uh, when we were doing the clutch over there. It's made by uh, Bergen Cable Company. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit pricey, but boy, it saves a lot of time from doing safety wire. And as you saw, we can save a lot of weight there. Basically, you have these cables. In this case, they're 32 thousandths. They have a ferrule attached at one end already. I actually grabbed the used one here. Let's go. Let me grab one that's not used. Okay, we'll grab one right here. They come in a packet. Okay. And so you can see the cables here. I don't know if you can see that. They've got one, a ferrule attached at one end already. So you feed that through the bolts or anything that you want a safety wire. As a matter of fact, we'll show you another place I used it on the end of the helicopter here. And then what you do is uh, ferrules for the other end come in a little tube. So you feed the wire through the tube and then through the end of this tool and you pull it tight. And when you crimp, squeeze this handle, it crimps the ferrule onto the end and cuts the cable very nicely. Uh, we can walk around here slowly and I'll show you where I used one externally. So here you can see where I used the safety cable external. I think it looks a whole lot cleaner than safety wire. Uh, it just, as I said, you can see a ferrule at one end where you start it, feed the cable through, come up this side, feed it through again, Put the ferrule on and crimp it with this. This just goes right over top, squeeze it, it crimps the ferrule and cuts the cable. It does a really nice job. And so you can use that like on propeller bolts? Yes, we do as a matter of fact. As long as you use the proper size, these come in 20 and 32 thousandths uh, and I think 40 thousandths as well, but we will use them. Uh, anywhere you can use uh, safety wire, you can use these. So here's another major accomplishment in the last couple of hundred hours, and that was the installation of the fuel bladder. So fuel bladder concepts were kind of new to me. All the airplanes that I've built so far have either had metal uh, tanks that have been done with Pro Seal as you rivet them together, or fiberglass tanks in the case of the Kit Fox and the Just Superstall. So uh, bladder here in the Hummingbird is a 57 gallon bladder. It sits underneath the rear seats. It's surrounded by puncture-proof, uh, some kind of fiberglass material it's called, so it's that if you do get a puncture somewhere on the sides of the fuel tank, it's protected from rupture in case of, so you don't get a fire or something there in a the fuel leak. So, uh, you know, we got all those in there on the side. That took some time. The other thing that took a lot of time, let me grab this roll of duct tape to show you, is, you know, with... With bladders, you want to make certain that when you put them inside here, you don't have them rubbing against any protruding uh, anything, okay? Lots of rivets were used in the assembly of this thing, as well as if you come around the back side here and look on the firewall, you can see a lot of bolt penetrations into the fuel cavity down there. So we've got a lot of nut plates and a lot of protruding heads. So you want to protect that. We used a whole roll of this... Uh, Duct tape, very high quality duct tape, multiple layers over top of everything so that uh, nothing's going to rub on that bladder. And then before you put the bladder in, you clean up that very, very well. Uh, you can understand all the metal filings from building a metal aircraft there. And then use some uh, Johnson's baby powder or talc powder. And, uh, and so it's nice and free in there. And that rubber fuel bladder can sit there and move around. You got to stuff it in there. There's Velcro in various places along the top and sides to hold it in place when it's empty. 
Uh, obviously, when you fill it up, it should uh, stay in shape. And then you can see there's lots of covers here on the inside. Uh, you know, a lot of these were just to get your hands in there to work around. You've got the, the fuel entry point here, filler neck. Here are the covers. This is the fuel sender. I use Pro Seal when I put these on so they don't leak. There's another cover underneath that seat. And speaking of seats, are you getting a good picture of that seat? Carol's been just as busy on the seats. I think both back seats are completed, right? Yes. They are super comfortable. And I can't wait to get the front seats in so I can sit and play. Um, but that's the progress that we've made there. So I won't know if anything leaks yet until we put some fuel in it, but gonna, we're going to wait till after paint before we do that. All right, taking a look at the belly down here. It gets kind of complicated underneath this helicopter. You can see the routing here from the anti-torque cables uh, through the phenolic here to protect them on the belly, going back, and then they route to another pulley there on the firewall. We come forward a little bit here. You can see where the throttle cable and the rotor brake cable exit the aircraft. Uh, we still have to put in a mixture cable and route the brake lines. I'm going to wait till after paint to do the brake lines because they're, they're the clear plastic stuff. Uh, if you look over here, you can see on the fuel system, I've added a quick drain there out the side of the aircraft to make it a little easier to get to. Uh, coming forward here, you can see transponder antenna. Let's see if we can get that to focus a little better. There's a transponder antenna as well as an OAT probe right there and a fly LED beacon. And uh, we'll put a fly LED beacon on top as well, and then a narrow LED strobe light on the tail. Uh, so you going back here, you can see the ADSB antenna. And let's see if we can get a decent shot here of the fuel output. Doesn't look like it. But anyway, there's the bottom of the uh, fuel tank. Let me go around there and see if I can get a better picture of that. So here's the, uh, where the uh, fuel bladder exits the aircraft. You can see there's one big line going to the back, to the gas glader. And then I added another line here to come out for a fuel drain. There's a quick drain for pre-flight. And then I made one other modification here that you can see. Is I've added a fuel cutoff valve that's controllable from the cockpit. There were no provisions for a fuel cutoff valve in the kit. And, uh, you know, for two reasons. One, for maintenance, I'd like to be able to turn off the fuel from the tank, as well as, you know, hopefully never have a, a, a engine fire. It's, fire it's firewall rearward here in the helicopter, but I want to be able to turn off the fuel to that part of the aircraft if anything were to go wrong. So uh, I've got to add the cable yet, but uh, that's all installed as well.